All right, this is the start of the 2016 AMC 10A. In these early questions, you want to try and learn to be efficient with the way that you calculate. A lot of them are just simple calculations, but those seconds that you save in calculating can be applied to future problems. Um, so it's kind of like a bank of time that you're saving up for questions that take more time. So let's get started. Uh, what is the value of 11 factorial minus 10 factorial over 9 factorial? You should immediately think of factoring out a 10 factorial, leaving 11 minus 1 over 9 factorial. You should see that this cancels with this to leave a 10, and 10 times 10 is 100. All right, and then continuing on to problem 2 of the 2016 10a. For what value of x does this expression uh, equal? Um, okay, so look for shortcuts. 10 to the x, leave alone. You should look at 100 and go, hey, that's 10 squared, and 10 squared to the 2x is 10 to the 4x. This is 10 to the 3rd to the 5th, which will become 10 to the 15th. That's 5x. 10 to the 5x equals 10 to the 15th, so x equals 3. All right, continuing on with the 2016 10a problem 3, we're going to do it two different ways. The first way is just kind of a reasoning approach, and the second one will involve an equation. For every dollar Ben spent on bagels, David spent 25 cents less. Ben, that's the first person, paid 12.50 more than David. This is how I solved it the first time. Just instantly think, this is some number of quarters. Figure out how many it is, because every one of those quarters is a dollar that Ben spent. Because this is how much more than David he spent, not total amount. So there's uh, four quarters and a dollar, and you've got $12, that's 48 quarters, plus two more quarters is 50 quarters more. That means Ben spent $50. And we know that he spent $12.50 more than David, so just subtract $12.50. Subtracting 12 gives 38. Subtracting 50 cents gives 37.50 for David. Add those, and that gives you C. Now, the second way that you can do it is you can make it into an equation. Say Ben spent X dollars, and you have to think about it a little bit here, too. If David spent 25 cents less, then he spent, uh, you know, that's, that's one-fourth of a dollar. So he spent one-fourth of X um, less than what uh, Ben spent. And this must be the amount that's equal to 1250, right? So we can set this equal to 1250. And you multiply by 4 to get x equals 50. Notice that's one of the trap answers. Because a lot of people solve for x and go, yay, I got x. That's what I was, yeah, great. x isn't the answer. We're not looking for x. Be careful with that in this test. They do it a lot. Okay, so x is 50. And then you do the same thing, subtract 1250 to get David and end up with the same conclusion. All right, on to problem number 4 of the 2016 AMC 10A. The remainder function can be defined for all real numbers x and y with y not equal to 0 by remainder x, y equals x minus y times this expression. Uh, this is the floor function, also called greatest integer function. Um, it has a few other notations. One of them is like int of x. Another one is a bracket you'll see sometimes in textbooks and it's also called the floor function. All of these do the same thing. They take this value which is inside and round it down to the previous integer. So for example, if you have 2.8, it's equal to two. Be careful when you go negative. If you have negative 3.4, that's not negative three, that's not rounding down. On a number line, negative four is here and negative three here, and you're right here. You need to round back to negative four. That's the one thing to be careful about with greatest integer functions. Um, if you haven't made that mistake yet, then uh, maybe you won't. But usually people who have made that mistake are conscious of that and are very careful in thinking about it when working with this problem. So it's this expression, which is kind of weird. Like we know what remainders are. Uh, we should explore this. We shouldn't, really, you don't have to understand what this is. All you have to do is follow the formula. You just literally plug in what they're going to give you. That's X and that's Y. And we can do it that way. That's great. But we should also have a mind of curiosity. 
what is this? We don't see this in high school textbooks. You don't even see it too much in other textbooks. Even AOPS, I'm not sure where you find it at. So let's explore it for a second. Let's just make something up. Let's say I've got 10 and 3. It doesn't even say what's being divided by what. Let's guess that it means 10 and 3, and it's 10 divided by 3. Right, so let's, uh, we know what the remainder is. It's 1, right? Let's see if we get 1 by plugging into here. So you get 10 minus 3 times 10 over 3. Well, this is a little bit more than 3, 3, point, 3 and 1 third. Rounded down, it'll be 3, and 10 minus 3 times 3 is 9. 10 minus 9 is 1. It does give us the remainder. Feel free to play around with this with other integers and see how it works. Become more comfortable with it in case it makes a repeat appearance or just because it's interesting. Okay, uh, so back to where we were. Um, this expression where that denotes the greatest integer less than or equal to x over y. Oh, one other side note, there's also a ceiling function, which you don't see as often, but it means round up. So like that, uh, if you put 1.7 in there, it rounds up to 2. Ceiling up, floor down, it makes sense. Okay, um, what is the value of this expression? Now we're dealing with fractions, which is a little weird, and one of them is negative. Can you even do that? Just whatever. If you're on the test and you come across this, don't explore it at that time. Right? It's, a, it's a little hard to want to do those things. You don't have time. But when you're studying and preparing, maybe do look into those kinds of things. But on the test, just tell your mind not to worry about if that's possible. Follow the formula. We're just going to plug it in. 3 eighths is x. 3 eighths minus y. Now notice y is negative, so minus a negative is plus 2 fifths times. And this is a fraction divided by a fraction. We're trying to save time on the test and work efficiently. It's not schoolwork. You're not proving your answer to anyone else. There's no teacher who's going to say, oh, you didn't show your work. In fact, if you can do it with less work, the better, because you're saving time. So uh, 3 eighths divided by y, right? So divided by a fraction, what do you do when you divide? You flip and multiply, right? Reciprocal multiply. So times negative 5 over 2. That's the equivalent of this expression. Now, this does not simplify, uh, it just becomes negative 15 over 16, and you have 2 fifths times that. Okay, then where is this? It's almost to negative 1, but negative 1 is to its left, and 0 is to the right, and we want to go to the left, which is the equivalent of rounding down. So this is going to be turning us right back into a negative, basically. It's negative 1 times 2 fifths. So I have 3 eighths minus 2 fifths. Now, in reality, on my paper, I'm probably not writing this. I'm just writing it to show you my thought. But in reality, you should probably see that this becomes negative, realize we need common denominators, and just multiply in the next step. So 15 over 40 to make common denominator with 8 and 5 times 5 over 5 and times 8 over 8 will be minus 16 over 40 kind of weird. It does give a negative remainder, whatever that might mean, um, but we don't really care for the sake of the problem. Maybe look into it with a Google search. So B, negative 1 over 40. That's the answer. All right, the last problem of this video will be problem 5. Um, again, the goal of these first 5 to 10 problems or so is to try to work as efficiently as possible without making a mistake. Um, you're, you're saving up that time in a time bank to invest in later problems. If this is your first time taking it or you're relatively new to the AMC, don't go as fast, right? Adjust your speed accordingly depending on your experience. Um, for those who have done most of the tests, you're trying to increase your speed, but not so much. You kind of got to get a feel for it. Not so much that you make mistakes because mistakes are really not okay. Don't make them as much as possible. Um, a rectangular box has integer side lengths in the ratio of 1 to 3 to 4. Uh, which of the following could be the volume of the box? Pay attention to qualifying words. Some people will say to even underline them. Integer and could, right? So integer side lengths. So one thing too, there's kind of like little truisms. Uh, I say it's like green light go. When you're at a green light or when your parents are, maybe you don't drive yet. Uh, when they're at the green they don't think. They don't think, oh, the light is green, I should go. They just go. Right? It's, like a, it's like an automatic response to a stimulus. When the light turns green, they just go. They're not really having conscious thought about it. You need to have those kind of conscious, uh, non-conscious thought reactions, right? Stimulus, react. 
The stimulus is a ratio written like this. This is almost always true, but typically what you want to do when a ratio is written like that is just put a little x next to all the numbers, either mentally or actually do it on paper, right? It's up to you. On paper, it's going to take a little bit more time. If you just picture the x's there, that's fine. Um, it talks about volume. Well, the volume is the product of the three lengths of the rectangular box. So this times this times this is 12x cubed, right? And you need this to equal one of these things. And keep in mind, because it said integer, x has to be an integer. If it's anything but an integer, some of these won't come out to be integers. And that's not OK. So we need integer for it. It has to be an uh, integer value. Now, the thing is, what does that mean? How do we apply this quickly? Here's what we need. Don't write 144 here. Picture it in your mind. If you wrote it, we'll write it for a second so you can see our thoughts. Divide by 12. Do that in your mind. x cubed equals 12. Is 12 a perfect cube? It is not, so this is not the answer, right? So then you just go through till you find it. If we try 96, what's 96 over 12? It's 8. Is 8 a perfect cube? You bet your rear end it is. So put in 8 is the the value of x cubed, so the answer must be 96. Now, because we're kind of flying quickly, we actually have the time to check the other answers so that we know that we're right. We don't just think we're right. We don't just suspect, but we know. There's no way we could be wrong. How do we do that? If this 12 was to go into one of these and also produce another perfect cube, there would be an issue, wouldn't there? Either one of two things is true. Our reasoning is wrong. Our plan of attack is not good reasoning, in other words. Or the test makers made a mistake and put two answers that both work. The second one is extremely unlikely. That doesn't make any sense. It's happened maybe once in 20 some odd years. So it's more likely the first one that our reasoning was a problem. And that's why you should quickly check these. That's not hard to divide by 12 for most people in their mind. 64 is not divisible by 12. 56, does it go in? It doesn't, right? It goes into 48 and doesn't go into 56. It also goes into 60. It does go into 48 four times. Is four a perfect cube? It's not. Now we don't just think it's 96, we know. That is critical. That gives you the confidence as you move forward to not think back to the first five, because a lot of times we're trying to figure out how many we should answer to get qualified for the AIME. See you in the next set of five.